the wild windy sea. I can hear her calling to me. So let's heave away, haul away, and fill our eyes with the shore. Calls to friends, ale and light, and a tale to brighten the night. So heave away, haul away, and heed the siren song. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Salty Siren Podcast, your number one source for vaguely accurate but greatly entertaining ship-slash-naval history. I'm your host, David Bradbury, and with me today is our other regular... Jack McFarling, a vast ye. Hell yeah, brother. Um, <laughs> so, we'll, we'll cut to the chase pretty quick with this one, because Jack is already well aware of the uh, sort of subject for today. But, dear listener, you are not. So, today we're not covering a specific time period or a specific battle, nor are we cons- uh, fuck. <laughs> nor are <laughs> we covering a specific ship or commander or anything, but something that relates to naval history as a whole. We are covering naval doctrine and tactics throughout the ages. I thought that it was time that we uh, shed a little bit of light on those sort of pre-sailing ship days, and also kind of went into the reason why things get made. Uh, Plus, I am just a slut for design philosophy, so (laughs) I love, love reading about the decisions people made and why they made them. Well, all right. I bet this will be one of those episodes where you say something and I'm like, oh, that's where that comes from. Yeah, it's it's certainly interesting, especially the early period stuff. I, I really didn't think about a lot of the uh, a lot of the items on here. But um the first sort of period of conventional tactics we shall refer to as the era of galley tactics. It's also referred to as sort of the uh, antiquity era, but it's really just sort of like from the dawn of time until the 16th century. So it's it's a pretty long period, <laughs> but uh, most of what we're going to be talking about involves the galley. Uh, the galley, for those unaware, is a sort of long, usually lightened ship that didn't sit particularly low in the water. Uh, they often had like a few sails, but like one hundred percent of the time had a shitload of oars. Like, picture the number of oars in your head. Add at least, like, a shitload more, and that's about right. Like, it's a fucking lot. So, they were super fast for the time, and they didn't rely on the wind to get around. And where they were used, kind of mostly along, like, coastal locations and really not going too far out to sea they're sort of relatively high like they sat relatively high in the water and that wasn't an issue because they weren't experiencing that rough of waters but um the the thing that i found that was kind of interesting is that they actually saw the sails as a hindrance a good amount of the time uh, and worried that they could be kind of like caught up on things. So it was a pretty common practice for if you were like already relatively close to the battle, um, you would just like straight up ditch the sails in port 
and just row there. <laughs> okay, that makes more sense. Because I was I was thinking, what does this get stuck on? Ocean trees? <laughs> right. No, it's it's more of like, um, I I guess it was more of like they didn't want the chance of like you know your your rigging comes undone and the sail flaps open and then you're sailing into the wind and like they, they're just like it's, it's not fucking worth it take the sails off before we go into battle and if you were going into battle and had like sailed there you would always like make sure that the sails were up which is very very different from the sort of sailing age which we'll get to later but um the earliest naval battle ever recorded uh, has the Egyptian pharaoh by the name of Ramses III absolutely shitting on the elusive sea people, which some of you may have heard of, some may have not. It's believed that these are the same sea people who caused the Bronze Age collapse, so fuck them. But... Um, Pretty much our, our only record of this is, like, Egyptian-made hieroglyphics and tablets that are just, like, look at how many fucking arrows we riddled these guys with. Like, seriously, <laughs> like, it, it is kind of hard to decipher the image under, like, all the cuts that had been made into the stone to denote arrows in mid-flight. But, in general... Uh, tactics of those days were entirely based around kind of pelt the enemy with arrows, uh, try and get closer, try and board them, and then just fight hand to hand. Because there weren't Could really any like big naval siege things. But you had a question. Could I get some more context on the sea people if you have? more so the sea people is like there's they're a very strange group it's not entirely clear what they are because you know when you're talking like you know a good like eight centuries five centuries before like we get to AD years, the record keeping wasn't that great. Right. So, but as far as we can tell, uh, the Bronze Age pretty much made uh, Lego Yoda death noise because <laughs> this group of people referred to as the Sea People kind of showed up out of nowhere and started shitting all over the Mediterranean, Fertile Crescent, all that stuff. And oh. society really just, like, fell apart. Well, but, damn. uh, yeah, it's, again, because their sort of arrival heralded, like, a complete collapse of civilization. Who exactly they were, where they came from, like, really anything about them just isn't known. But this is, this is one of the few times where they're mentioned, so we know they existed, but, uh, yeah, it's basically just Ramses being like, we absolutely arrowed the fuck out of them. <laughs> but, yeah, it, it looks it looks pretty miserable. But, like I said, the main... There were sort of three main tactics back in those earliest of days, which appear to have been uh, bombarding with arrows and sort of like light ranged weapons that they had at the time boarding actions or uh slightly more rarely and we only know about this because it's depicted in the hieroglyphics throwing sort of grappling hooks and uh like other like bits of rope onto an enemy ship and then just like tug of warring it to the point where it capsizes wow okay yeah That's which of... which <laughs> I, I think is really possible because one, the ships were sort of purposefully built lighter they were higher in the water and were probably smaller than the galleys that we're currently picturing in our heads 
but yeah, that's also a point for leaving the sails at home. It's less things uh, for yeah. your allies to or enemies to snag onto and use to haul you over. I bet that would be actually be pretty tight <laughs> if you and your homies threw grappling hooks at an enemy ship and fucking capsized it with your bare hands. Oh yeah, no, you you had to feel like the manliest man of all time pulling that <laughs> shit off. <laughs> yeah, but um, now in in general, those earliest of days were it really. I think most of it was kind of land battles on boats. That it was kind of like yeah, we throw arrows at each other until we're too close for the arrows to work. At which point we board and fight it out. And hopefully win. Just with the adding of a little bit of spice in the grappling hooks and capsizing ships. Naturally. Uh, but with that, we move into a uh, sub-era, which I have titled Ram Ranch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because... <laughs> uh, otherwise known as about 8th century B.C., so, ramming emerged as a tactic as early as uh, the 8th century BC, but one of the best sort of historical examples we have of it is, uh, I'm going to try not to butcher this because it's an old Greek name, but uh, Herodotus, or Herodotus, w- whichever way you want to pronounce it, but shouts out to my boy because he did some pretty he he basically let us know sort of the naval tactics of the day by describing how like naval conflicts during the persian wars were effectively greek and persian ships uh sailing towards each other just trying to ram each other and if that didn't work boarding and fighting it out but uh Mm. So it was kind of this 5th century where the ramming really got to ranching. <laughs> but uh, you, you sounded like you had a, a question there. Yeah, if I recall world history correctly, the and maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but the trireme was basically a vessel purpose-built for ramming other boats. Yeah. Like, ramming was, like, the big deal. It's it's especially around that, like, 5th century of kind of the Persian Wars and ancient Greece that, you know, the trireme and things like it, where they... Which the trireme, I, I think, is a type of galley because it's mostly ore-powered. But basically they built the whole front of the ship to have this kind of like almost like the bulbous nose that we talked about last episode but it was usually built as sort of like a hook or sometimes a a plate that was either made out of or plated in bronze and all of that so it added additional weight added additional durability Pretty much the entirety of naval battles was just kind of trying to sail out to the side so you could see the side of another ship, and then just going for it as hard as you could, hoping that your ram would kind of punch through the the belly. But I was kind of surprised by this. Like, popular depictions of, like, ramming actions and things like that depicted as, like, you just obliterate like whatever you're hitting but these galleys back then were like so light and like you know again sitting pretty high in the water that even if you sort of like slammed the fuck out of someone's ship the chances of it sinking were still like very very low so ramming was almost used more to like flood the bottom parts of the ship with water to the point where it was so slow it basically took it out of the fight so 
if it's not able to really like move around or do shit, um, it can't deploy the soldiers on board for the boarding actions. It can't sort of like, as we get later on, like it can't bring its archers to bear or ranged weapons. But, Makes sense. um, yeah. Uh, when we get to sort of the, the late BCs, so getting lower in number, uh, ramming once again kind of fell out of favor, but uh, wasn't replaced entirely. While ramming was still kind of always used alongside, like, the boarding and the ranged weapons and all that, uh, with the late BCs, we really get to the point where the Romans are kind of dominating everything and being much more of a, like, army-based power and less so sea-based, um, they, they really reverted back to, like, just fucking bored everything because we have, like, a million legionaries who are <laughs> willing to just, like, hop on there and they're better equipped and trained than a lot of the people we're fighting. So... At that point, they, they still did do ramming because, like the Romans did with all things, they kind of borrowed a lot of Greek designs. But um, with this, um, the Romans actually led to the first sort of major change that we would see in ship design philosophy, where there became more of a focus... Uh, or there was more of a focus placed on ships tended to win battles if they were harder to ram and could carry more soldiers. So this is where designs started to shift and ships began to generally get heavier, get larger, so they could carry more troops, and so they could be sort of better protected against any potential ramming attacks. Um, this, of course, meant sort of like sacrificed maneuverability, but um, this also sees the introduction of some of our first, like, actual kind of, like, ship-to-ship -ship weaponry where the ships got large enough and heavy enough that they could support really fucking sick uh, ship catapults. Nice, nice. So, you know, you'd have, like, a, a little, like, catapult, and as things got more advanced, have it on kind of, like, a rotating dais, so you could fire it into other ships onto the shoreline as troops are, like, sort of making a landing... But in general, these sort of, like, later Roman-designed galleys became heavier, larger, and now supported, like, actual kind of big guns, so to speak. When does but the ballista come to the picture? The, the ballista's coming pretty much right up. <laughs> Because nice. around the first century AD, we had another sort of shift in design philosophy and another shift in um, tactics. But around the first century AD, ramming was now completely gone. Like, you were a crazy person if you thought ramming was a solid strategy. Also, light galleys had just been replaced entirely because it's now time... For the eastern half of the Roman Empire, otherwise known as the Byzantine Empire, to just rule the fucking seas for the next, like, pretty much 1500 years. Um, Damn. So, again, as the Roman Empire made a Lego Yoda death noise in the west, uh, <laughs> big ship battles really started to sort of ramp up. And then, out of the east, the Byzantines promptly shat all over anyone <laughs> attempting to have any sort of naval presence uh, by inventing the goddamn M2 flamethrower. <laughs> like, I'm kind of shitting you, kind of not. 
because uh, despite the name, the Byzantines were really the ones who came up with Greek fire. Oh. And so I didn't know this. Again, I suppose movies, popular sort of perception. But I was of the mind that Greek fire was something that you really... You sort of like dipped an arrow in and then launched it over. But uh, the Byzantines, I guess, again, having that whole like Roman heritage, like penchant for engineering shit. Um, have you ever seen those like water guns for like pool days that are effectively just like a tube and a handle? And you kind of like pull the handle back with, like, the nose of the thing in the water, and it fills the whole tube with water. And yeah, I know you what you're can, talking about. Yeah, you can, like, slam the handle in, and it just, like, geysers out like a jet. <laughs> uh, basically that. Like, they straight up had these, like, metal tube Greek fire flamethrowers that they would place at the nose of these heavy galleys. And so... <laughs> naval well, warfare <laughs> yeah like it's fucking insane it's just like literally jumping from like yeah the Romans made a major upgrade by putting catapults on theirs to the Byzantines made a major upgrade by adding what were effectively like armored flamethrower compartments <laughs> and Damn. so you know ships of the day being made of wood really didn't stand up too well to <laughs> Greek fire. And so the Byzantines just, again, kind of just ran shit for a while. Like <laughs> Yeah, naval... Byzantines from, from the top rope. <laughs> Pretty much. Like, it was really, really, really fucking hard to combat this because the... It, like... And I, I, I just personally sort of love this, this like whole design philosophy. Is there's again a shift to even heavier uh, galleys because the Byzantine strategy then kind of became the ship needs to. Well, let me, let me back up. Their strategy for any sort of opponent to the Byzantines became. We're not going to survive if they close to Greek fire range, so we need to just kill them before they get here. And so, in sort of response to that, the Byzantines said, our galleys need to be tough enough to weather the sort of approach to the point where we know we'll win with Greek fire. So. Again, there becomes this kind of, like, heavier shift in the vessels that are being run. It's around this time, too, that uh, we see someone coming up with the idea of raised uh, sort of fore and aft decks. So the, the shape that you're kind of familiar with, with, like, sailing ships, if they're kind of being, like, a lowered central platform, a raised nose, and a raised rear. That started kind of coming in here as well. Um, they believe that it would, and while it did, help uh, archers sort of rain down fire onto opposing ships. But uh, effectively, the Byzantines took a little bit of a gamble, because even then, these ships are just so so big that even if you set them on fire with Greek fire, the odds of them actually like burning down and sinking are still pretty low. And so the ultimate goal was still to capture the enemy ship. So uh, they'd close to range, torch your ass, and once they were pretty sure that most of the crew had burned to death, they would then send in these like heavily armored sort of Byzantine versions of centurions who would work as sort of the first, like, marines, really. Like, trained specifically for sort of shipboard fighting, and their whole purpose was to sort of, like, mop up after the Greek fire and, like, other weapons had whittled down the crew. 
gross. But I don't know. I I, I dug it in general because I was like, damn, they've got like this whole like action plan figured out. <laughs> and yeah, I, I mean, mean 15, 1500 years, they've got a solid formula. Right. But um, the other sort of cool thing that came from this was that the Byzantines uh, held like such an astounding amount of power that their primary naval formation also like went unaltered for basically that whole period. Uh, they called it the Crescent, and it's pretty much what it sounds like. They formed sort of like a crescent moon shape. Uh, with the points sort of facing towards the enemy. And the goal was that the heaviest galleys, sort of like their best fighting ships, would be positioned towards the tips to help sort of fight off any ships attempting to flank them, but also to hopefully sort of corral the ships to the point where they could surround them. Or, you know, at the very least, do sort of a pincer maneuver. Oh, so like the the moon kind of flips, it kind of inverts. Right. So it's it's effectively those two points driving towards the enemy, and if they're sort of doing well holding in the enemy ships, they would sort of move out and sort of pull the tips of the crescent into like a full circle so they had them like trapped yeah or they could sort of drive both points inwards and like focus fire on one part and it just proved devastatingly effective yeah like to, to the point where you know pretty pretty soon that was just kind of the naval tactic of the time was crescent formation and if you weren't the byzantines uh pray that your opponent wasn't the byzantines <laughs> <laughs> but um around the 14th century we started to get our first introductions of gunpowder and shortly after followed cannons um but really, the interesting thing was that cannons did not make that big of an impact to start. Uh, for one, they were, like, prohibitively expensive to produce, and there was the worry that, like, you know, it, if basically if the ship gets jostled too hard and the cannon goes over the side, you just sank a fuckload of money to the bottom of the ocean. Um, and also... Uh, Cannon's effective range starting out was not very great. Um, <laughs> their reload times were also longer. They were generally sort of like less refined. And so... Um, yeah, I'm just picturing a vaguely smooth tube. <laughs> I mean, kind of. Yeah, it. Uh, they weren't particularly great. But kind of the interesting thing is that the galleys being galleys, could, at a moment's notice, put on a burst of speed by basically being like, all right, dudes on the oars, go hard. And for that reason, cannons also remain slightly ineffective because their sort of effective range, a galley could cross in, like, under two minutes, and the reload time was a whole lot longer than that. <laughs> yeah. And so it, it effectively boiled down to they would wait until the last possible second when they were sure they'd be able to hit the enemy and they were sure that it would deal some damage. And that's when they would fire off the cannons. But it was really like you kind of fired them once per engagement and that was it. So I want to hear... I want to hear paper planes, but with third century cannons. God, all I want to do. <laughs> and then just, three minutes. Three minutes of just like Byzantine soldiers furiously scrubbing the inside of a metal tube. <laughs> for, for reference, dear listeners, there's a wonderful video out there that is 
the song Paper Planes, but with 18th century muskets. And it's just... <laughs> it's so fucking dumb. <laughs> the song goes from, like, two and a half minutes to, like, well over 20. It's... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in in the song, for context, it goes, all I want to do is uh, bang, 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 as in gunshots. Right. Um, and it's part of the beat. So, in this video, he fires and then reloads for a minute and a half and fires again. And he does that four times, and then the song <laughs> resumes after that. And then it goes right back. To... <laughs> oh, man. But... It... Enough about our really stupid memes. So, with sort of the 14th century and into the 15th century, we got into another sort of interesting tactic that saw the death of the Crescent, which was basically that the galleys and the number of ships being amassed at, like, major naval engagements were so large and so well crewed that usually all of the ships could not sort of participate in the battle at once. And so you formed these kind of like lines where the initial lines would kind of crash, you know, begin torching slash uh, firing cannons at each other, all of that stuff. And then boarding actions would ensue. But all of that took so long that ships kind of waiting for their turn could see that a friendly ship was being, was like going to lose and would basically counterboard a friendly ship to try and sort of keep it going. And you ended up with just this like huge clusterfuck of <laughs> galleys in kind of like a massive mob with them just, just a like, dog pile. <laughs> pretty much and uh but that's really where we saw the crescent sort of fall apart and lines begin to sort of become the more dominant thing and with the advent of the callan the, uh, the callan jesus the cannon it wasn't too long before we hit our next naval period it's 16th century sailing ships But, uh, yeah, so sailing ships, by 1501, we had switched from the Virgin Catapult and Ballistas, <laughs> which, uh, sorry, you did ask about Ballistas specifically, but I believe sort of a while towards the end of the Roman Empire and sort of a middle ground for a lot of those early days of the Byzantines, ballistas were used as another sort of, like, ranged engagement tool. But mm -hmm. pretty much all of it was for the purpose of just whittling down the crew to the point where you were confident you could take it in a boarding action. Right. But, um, with the 16th century sailing ships again... Uh, there even began to, uh, they began to do this practice of sort of cutting out firing ports in the hull of the ship so that cannons could sort of be fired from the side. Because previously, they were almost entirely fixed to the front of the ship on the raised sort of decking there, or the rear of the ship where there was raised decking. But... As uh, cannons were sort of fitted to the side, it became clear that um, galleys in their current form were kind of kind of not suited to being hit from the side by just about anything. And so there became this trend to kind of shorten and fatten the galleys. And that's really what gave birth to those first, like, sailing ships and man of wars is they, they wanted to sort of layer bits of timber to give additional protection against, like, the increasingly ever more powerful cannonballs. 
Um, and so with that, you needed like three times the amount of lumber that you did previously. So the ships kind of naturally became shorter, became more dense, but also grew taller because the taller they became, the more space you had below decks to carve out cannon ports. But most importantly, Jack, what happened around roughly 1500? Uh, Big event for Europe. The Black Death? I honestly can't remember off the top of my head when that was, but no. The Discovery of the New World. Ah. So... While galleys had kind of been on their way out for quite a while, the discovery of the New World was really the sort of death knell of the light sort of sailing or ore-based combat ship. Because also at this point, the ships just got too goddamn heavy to move by ore. There were some big mamajamas. Right. And... Especially when you're going over insanely long distances, such as crossing the Atlantic Ocean, um, you really, really need a, a sort of like a long-term plan for how the hell you're going to get there. And oars just didn't work. It required too much energy on the part of the people rowing the oars. And so there was an adoption of taller and taller masts, bigger and bigger sails, and fatter and fatter ships to carry the supplies necessary to get uh, the crew from Europe all the way over to North America. But uh, some enterprising young souls, and by that I mean pirates, <laughs> um, realized that these much bigger, sort of fatter, Man of Wars could really, like, not defend themselves that well. Because for the most part, the early ones, such as, you know, Columbus and things like that, weren't even armed. Uh, or if they were armed, they were armed incredibly lightly, because more than anything, the priority was packing enough supplies and then having a shitload of room to load up on valuables from the New World and bring it back. So, they realize that, hey, if we take even what's considered like a small ship, and we just gut the thing of storage space and replace it all with cannons and additional men, we can just obliterate much larger ships. And then we get to the Golden Age of Piracy. Yes. And so that's really when naval engagements started to kind of come into their own. This is where you begin to see the emergence of uh, that sort of like, ro I wouldn't quite say romanticized, but like Napoleonic era sailing and things like that. Uh, heroes such as Lord Admiral Horatio Nelson, uh, all those sort of folks. But the Golden Age of Piracy has... was pretty much the, this tiny little window where mainland Europe was not arming the ships well enough to make the voyage, and pirates were just able to take a sloop, load it full of guns, and just demand riches. But eventually... They started sending escorts, armed vessels, piracy got a whole lot harder, and enter a particularly entertaining figure known as Edward Teach. If I know you, who this is. You do know who this is. So tell tell our listeners. Um Well, actually no, I'm not so sure. Because <laughs> this guy is either Blackbeard or he was the Pirate Buster Supreme. I can't remember. 
You were right on the first one. Blackbeard okay. himself, Edward Teach. Now, we'll we'll probably give him an episode in his own right in the future, but Edward Teach is fascinating because Blackbeard is... I, I would say Blackbeard is probably the most recognizable pirate name, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah, for sure. He was a pirate for less than a year. <laughs> yeah, I think I remember reading that. Like, it is it is insane the amount of trouble that this man got up to. But, to sort of further illustrate this point of uh, kind of what astounding firepower you were able to bring to bear when cargo space wasn't a concern, uh, the reason that he caused such a problem is that his ship, the Queen Anne's Revenge, was an actual warship. Most of the pirates at the time were, you know, doing something similar to, like, modern-day Somali pirates, how they have what's basically just, like, a speedboat, but they've got a bunch of guns, a bunch of dudes, and their plan is to just pick on helpless targets with much better armament than them. Makes sense. Edward Teach took... A, yeah, he he took a ship that was already capable of going toe-to-toe with decent-sized warships of the day, and then he cut out anything that wasn't solely related to cannon <laughs> space and made it into cannon space. And so the Queen Anne's Revenge was mighty feisty for how big she was like even on sort of a warship scale but uh i digress the main parts of sort of tactics of the day come down to three things with the transition away from uh, rowing you are now entirely dependent on the wind to get you around. You could angle your sails and things like that to try and catch the wind and still propel yourself, but um, that really wasn't that effective. Um, The more you sort of angled your sails, the less it translated to direct forward motion, the more you sort of bled control and speed... And so, in general, you kind of had to go where the wind wanted to go. So a lot of engagements started being almost decided by who had the favor of the wind, who was Mm -hmm. upwind of their opponent, and they could kind of dictate the way the battle went, because they could actually fully decide where to go. Right. Right. But uh, the other major change from sort of the previous main, or like galley times, is that with the shortening, tallening, and fattening of vessels, um, there, there came to be a huge focus on like batteries of cannons lining each side of the ship. So now, instead of ships being sort of geared towards, like, charging in and, like, most of the power being focused at the nose, the nose and the rear were particularly weak now. Um, Usually the sides of the ship were the most well-armored, and uh, if you were hit from the front or from the back, you risked raking fire, which was where a cannonball could punch through and basically travel the whole length of the ship, hurling splinters, mowing people down as it went. Much more devastating than it just sort of punching through one side and out the other. Yeah, not not cash money. Not not cash money at all. Um, the the final constraint, although this this was honestly an improvement on the previous age, but um. The final constraint was communication. 
that now these ships were like well-oiled machines. They had all sorts of bits of like rigging, uh, mechanics and things like that, keeping them running. And so it became important to communicate with the other sort of ships in your battle group what was going on. And so this is where we start to see signal flags. Uh, a whole book full of like deciphering of what different flags meant was posted, usually on each like warship. And then you could communicate with other friendly vessels that were a ways away by hoisting up these flags. Problem is, uh, you get into a fight, cannons start firing, smokes everywhere, rigging's torn to pieces. Um, now those signal flags don't work so great. So, no. granted, any sort of long-distance communication was an improvement over the sort of galley times where there just wasn't... <laughs> you, kind, you kind of just, like, had a plan going in, but you were on your own from there. So. That's jazz, so, baby. That's jazz. Just improv it. Riffing. But, um, that's, that's really it in terms of, oh, no, I missed a major point. Uh, it's with this sort of change to the side-based uh, batteries that we see the emergence of the line of battle. And this is sort of a like upgraded version of the lines of battle that devolve into a dog pile of the late galley period, <laughs> um, where essentially, uh, credit to the Portuguese on starting this one, but ships would sail forward in a line and when they judged themselves to be at the right range would all turn the same direction and fire off a broadside before turning back to fire the other broadside while the first one reloaded very smart very smart indeed and this became known as the line of battle or the line You'll, you'll hear this in sort of, like, Napoleonic-era stuff, uh, like big ships, big warships being referred to as ships of the line. And that meant that they were big enough, bad enough, had enough armor, had enough cannons that they got to participate in this sort of, like, weaving broadside dance that was the typical battle tactics of the time. But, uh, with that, we move on to the next period where we hit naval tactics in the Age of Steam. Uh, this is round about when steam power sort of began to appear, so kind of start of the 19th century. Uh, we, we have the return of the champ ramming. So, <laughs> of course. <laughs> it's, history repeats itself, and in this case, it repeated itself because, uh, steam-powered vessels could go pretty fast, and could go pretty fast pretty reliably, because they no longer depended on the wind, no longer depended on, uh, galleys, oars, anything like that to get them moving. And so now, um, there was kind of like a, a revival of it. It was used as a tactic somewhat, but realistically, the, uh, the ships mostly tried to avoid hitting each other. <laughs> Because uh, even in the best of cases with steam power, there's a lot more force at work, and you were somewhat likely to injure yourself as badly as you injured your opponent. But the one thing that this did bring about is the sort of abandonment of the 
concentration on broadsides and line tactics. Because now, with how fast and consistently ships were able to move, uh, spreading your sort of longer broadside to the enemy uh, kind of exposed you for a ram. Makes sense. But uh, it's around this point where we start to get into one of my favorite little tidbits of history, which is experimentation with new technology. Uh, for those of you who have been through the U.S. schooling system, uh, you should have been taught about uh, the Merrimack and the Monitor during the Civil War. Jack, are you at all? Uh, uh, are you at all familiar? Yeah, old uh, old Ironsides. Hell yeah, and that was exactly it. For a while, there was kind of a prevailing thought that metal on a ship would make it too heavy. Uh, it, you know, it might sink. It might just put too much drag on it. Um, but ultimately, with ships such as the Merrimack, it was shown that being able to add metal to a ship and all of that added layer of protection combined with the complete non-penetrative power of a completely round steel ball um, <laughs> meant that Ironside ships were basically invincible against standard cannons. And while Ironsides and sort of the old sailing vessels sailed the same waters, uh, the Merrimack was used to devastating effect with incendiary shells, where it basically couldn't be hit, and a volley of its relatively small armament of cannons was able to burn down much larger wooden ships. Then yeah, have... for anyone who anyone who hasn't seen a picture of the Merrimack or the Monitor, it looks like if you took the Alamo and made it out of steel and made it float somehow. Yeah. That's what it looks like. I always likened it to, uh, or what was it? My, my U.S. history teacher said the Merrimack and the Monitor or Toblerone versus Tuna. That's <laughs> like... The Merrimack kind of ended up with this, like, longer but, like, triangular <laughs> kind of head, and the Monitor was this weird, weird ship that was designed specifically to fight other Ironside ships, but it was basically, like, two cannons on, like, a rotating circular turret. And the whole rest of the ship was almost, like, flush with the water. Like, yeah. trying to present as small of a target as possible to these other iron-sided ships. But, yeah, you you get to that crazy period where um, just everybody's like, oh, hey, we can make ships out of metal and they don't sink. Kind of don't need the big broadsides anymore. We can make them near invincible. Well, let's start making rounds that are meant to penetrate steel. And with, you know, kind of the advent of the mini ball and kind of pointed cartridges for rifles, that same thing uh, starts to be applied to cannons. And uh, later, cannons kind of phase out entirely in favor of actual rifled artillery. And finally, as the 19th century kind of draws to a close, uh, the torpedo is introduced. And everyone kind of collectively shits their pants. <laughs> uh, first successfully used in the 1891 uh, Chilean Civil War, where the battleship... Uh, Blanco Encallada was sunk while at anchor by just getting absolutely blasted by a little gunboat <laughs> with torpedoes. So yeah, I can I can imagine the 
the two guys standing on the on the ship and they see a tor- a long narrow object coming towards them in the water and they're like what the hell is that <laughs> <laughs> but um in general then with everyone kind of collectively shitting themselves over it there are some who are like eh, it wouldn't it's not going to make that big of an impact on naval warfare but uh Hmm. It, yeah, it soon proved that packing a whole fuckload of explosives into something that you can then send at someone from below the waterline was very effective. Um, early ones, though, did kind of suck. Uh, they couldn't be used with any real effect at uh, more than, like, 2,000 yards which, in terms of, like, naval engagements at that point, was, uh, you had to get pretty close. Um, water resistance was also an issue, um, and we're also pretty slow moving. So there was a good chance that in those early days, you could sort of see the trail of bubbles and be like, oh shit, we gotta move, and actually have the time to do so. But, uh... It is also with the advent of the torpedo that we start to see our first submarines. Nice, nice. So, with the sort of development of submarines, torpedo boats, and things of that nature, uh, Ironsides are almost completely gone at this point, replaced by ships built almost entirely out of steel, and we see the development of Dreadnoughts. Uh, So named after the uh, HMS Dreadnought, uh, which entered into service in 1906. But it was really the the first, like, quote-unquote battleship that said... Man, why the fuck are we using small guns? <laughs> and so, just ditch them entirely and focus. Ditch the, and, ditch the, ditch the virgin small guns for the Chad. <laughs> just like obliterator cannons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's... it. Uh, they also switched over to steam turbines as like the main propulsion. Which I think to some like that had been used on a lot of the sort of iron sides previously, but this was like big, big steam turbines to push this super heavily armored like artillery station in the water. But uh, pretty much overnight, everyone realized that every single ship they had in their navy could not beat the Dreadnought if they were all thrown at it at once. Um, So that just sort of ends uh, that sort of... that era of steam naval warfare. Oh, Johnny, Johnny, call and hear the ancient song. Of sailors long forgone and sailors still to be. A sweet and solemn tune spoke gently by the tide. O oh, Johnny, Johnny, fall, join the song. 